Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our third webinar in the series on the Canada Disability Benefit. We're so glad that you're here today and, and so nice to see so many of you again. Thank you for joining us. As people are joining in the webinar, I just want to take a minute to review some tech setup that will help you to enjoy the presentation um, as much as possible. We do recommend that you watch the webinar in speaker view. In the speaker view, we will have the main presenter spotlighted, as well as the ASL interpreters and the LSQ interpreters. You'll also see the graphic designer, Erin Johannes, who will be um, taking notes and, and um, later in the presentation, giving some, some plain language highlights of our presentation today. So again, we recommend that you choose speaker view to watch. You'll see in the top right hand corner, the option to choose speaker view or gallery view. And for those of you who are using shortcut keys, the speaker view is Alt F1. Today's presentation is also being interpreted and, and available in both French and English. At this point, I'll ask each one of you to choose either French or English to listen to this presentation in. It's important that one of these languages is selected and you don't need to switch back and forth throughout the presentation. Our presenters will some be speaking in English and some in speaking in French, but it will happen automatically for you when you choose one of these options. Also, we've received some feedback that the chat box and, and folks when they join, there's lots of um, notifications that come up. There is a way in the accessibility features to turn off the notifications. So if that's something that, that is distracting to you during the presentation, I suggest that you go to your accessibility functions and turn that option off. So again, it's important that you choose a language, either English or French. Also watch the presentation in speaker view. And again, um, the accessibility functions will help you to turn notifications off. So at this point, I think that most of our participants have joined us today. So I want to say welcome um, and thank you again for joining us. And I'm pleased to introduce our two co-hosts for today's session, Rabia and, and Jonathan. And, and Rabia, I'll turn it over to you. Morning uh, to our friends on the West Coast and good afternoon. Welcome to another dialogue in our quest to engage diverse voices of people with disabilities across this wonderful country. We started this journey last month with some discussions and we brought together hundreds of people. We mobilized interest from hundreds of people through these series of talks. November's Momentum is, is even better. Continuing the conversation of nothing about us without us. As people with disabilities, what has become very apparent through this pandemic is the fact that we have been left behind. We in fact have been forgotten, neglected, abused, victimized, marginalized, and oppressed as a result of not only the spread of this virus, but the steps taken to control the spread of this virus, the emergency measures introduced. We understand the need for safety, protection, health and well being but we also recognize the adverse impact that these measures are having on the quality of life, the independence, the dignity, the respect, the inclusion of people with disabilities across this country and across the globe. 
I'm going to take a bit of a personal journey today in this discussion. It's really, really become apparent to me. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see my rants. If you've read some of the articles that I've published in local papers based out of Mississauga here, you'll hear my rants. Uh, and, and before I get into that rant, I neglected one point and I apologize and let me just step back and say that we are all inhabitants of Turtle Island, a land sacred to our First Nations, Indigenous and Métis communities who have allowed us to be guests in these occupied lands and to live with them in harmony, we hope. This is our dream, this is our passion to, for all of us to be included as, as sisters, brothers, siblings, as human beings with the natural environment in a way that is holistic, healthy, inclusive and embraces all differences. So thank you to our First Nations, Indigenous and Métis friends, brothers and sisters for allowing us to share in this land of theirs, sacred to them. So my, I have, so I'm a person with a disability. I identify myself as a racialized, visibly Muslim woman with a disability. I have siblings with disabilities. I'm an activist, an advocate, a daughter of aging parents and all kinds of stuff that I do out there in the world. My brother who has a severe developmental disability was hospitalized. And in that process, we feel that we've neglected him, abandoned him and it's heart wrenching for his own good to provide him the care that he needs, which has nothing to do with COVID, but COVID-19 protocols are complicating our lives to support each other. And that feeling of neglect and abandonment that we're feeling as his family, I cannot imagine what he's feeling. So the needs of people with disabilities are not being taken into consideration as we plan to manage through this pand pandemic through at various levels of our society. And it also means that we are having an adverse financial impact. Finally, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to make change happen. I thoroughly believe that every obstacle is an opportunity. And in that quest of that opportunity, we are going to have a dialogue today about the power of inclusive design that I'm really looking forward to. And I'm going to pass it over to my friend uh, who's co-hosting with me, Jonathan, to take it away from here. Thank you. Bon, bien, merci, Radia. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Mon nom, c'est Jonathan Marchand. Je suis un activiste, un défenseur des droits des personnes handicapées. Euh, je suis président d'une coopérative qui s'appelle Coop Assist et qui vise à créer un nouveau programme d'assistance personnelle autodirigée au Québec. Euh, je suis aussi un porte-parole de Every Canadian Counts. C'est un organisme qui vise à mettre en place un programme d'assurance invalidité au Canada. À cause du manque de, de soutien pour les personnes handicapées au, au, au Québec et au Canada, euh, je suis contraint de vivre dans une institution un centre d'hébergement de longue durée dans la région de Québec. Euh, j'ai des besoins d'assistance qui sont plus élevés que la moyenne. Euh, en fait, j'ai besoin d'assistance 24 heures sur 24 à cause que j'utilise un respirateur artificiel. Au Québec, euh, notre groupe il vise à, à créer un nouveau programme d'assistance personnelle qui va inclure des personnes comme moi qui ont des besoins plus importants et d'autres aussi. On utilise une approche qui est personnalisée où le soutien est adapté aux besoins individuels de chacun. Notre groupe a d'autres jeunes personnes handicapées qui sont contraintes de vivre dans des institutions et ils veulent sortir aussi pour regagner leur liberté. C'est très important quand on développe des nouvelles mesures, des nouveaux programmes, d'inclure ceux qui ont des besoins plus importants ou plus spécifiques. Parce qu'au final, tout le monde en bénéficie. On développe ainsi des mesures qui sont inclusives et vont fonctionner pour à peu près tout le monde. Mais pour y arriver, il faut que les personnes concernées 
et leur famille soient consultés directement. Et avec notre programme, euh, au Québec, c'est ça qu'on fait. On, a, on est en pour parler directement avec le gouvernement. Il faut laisser personne de côté dans, nos, dans notre approche. Environ 28 des personnes handicapées au Canada vivent dans la pauvreté. Ça représente environ 800 000 personnes. Il faut qu'on qu nous soutienne pour qu'on puisse vivre de bonne vie dans la communauté, hein, comme tous les autres citoyens. Le soutien euh, doit inclure hein, des mesures pour l'assistance personnelle, l'habitation, le transport, l'accessibilité universelle et les aides techniques. Pour ça, un programme d'assurance invalidité au niveau fédéral, c'est nécessaire. C'est ce qu'on tente de faire avec Every Canadian Council. Mais pour sortir une grande partie des personnes handicapées et leurs familles de la pauvreté, une prestation canadienne d'invalidité est une nécessité. Il est primordial d'inclure tous ceux qui ont des besoins euh, plus importants. Euh, il faut avoir une mesure qui est très inclusive et répond aux besoins spécifiques de chaque personne handicapée. Donc, merci. Bonne conférence. Thank you very much, Rabia and Jonathan, for, for sharing that perspective with us. And thank you again for everyone who is continuing to join our session today. We started these webinars probably about four or five weeks ago now, following the throne speech where it was announced that a new Canada disability benefit would be announced. We had Evelyn Bourget talk to us about the basic of basic income. And then Michael Prince joined us for our second webinar to talk about what is the Canadian benefit that people with disabilities need and want. And, and last week, um, we were pleased to have Peter McLeod with us talking about ways that we can organize as people with disabilities and community members in order to support this benefit um, to come into place. And today we're so glad to have Yuta Trevenis with us to talk about the power of inclusive design. So Yuta, in, in just a minute, I'll in, invite you to share. Then we'll hear from Gary Block and Aaron Johannes and Liz Edmanski and some of the other responders that we have with us today. So Yuta, thank you for being here with us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I'm just gonna quickly share my screen and I'm hoping that it all works. Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank you, Yuta. Okay, great. And uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, Jonathan, and Ravi. I, I'm so honored to be part of this amazing um, workshop and initiative. Um, the title of my talk, as you said, is The Power of Inclusive Design. And um, I think it's quite fitting that we acknowledge and express gratitude to the Indigenous custodians of this unceded land. Much of what I will talk about today is part of Indigenous knowledge, actually. And in fact, um, what I will talk about is probably not new to you or unknown to most of you who are participating. I am just reaffirming much of what you already know through your lived experience. Um, and the amazing effort uh, that we are undergoing here is who is powered by our commitment to nothing about us without us. And we have a design challenge to participate in the design of promised disability benefits that were announced within the throne speech. And uh, often when we talk about a design challenge within the design school, um, we uh, talk about a design brief. And I thought what I'd do um, to start is just to talk a little bit or run through what is our design brief? What is this design challenge that we all hope to participate in so that this very, very critical and important thing is not without us? The design brief we have is to break the vicious cycle of poverty that accompanies disability. And, um, our community knows that there are many entangled and reinforcing vicious cycles. I'm just showing a picture here of one of many. And uh, unfortunately, we at the IDRC, and, and one of the reasons why um, we 
have been developing and trying to work on alternative forms of inclusive design or of design is that um, the innovations in the technology and the intended ways to address problems often amplify, automate, and accelerate the vicious cycles. And I won't um, describe this entire vicious cycle that I'm showing on the screen, but it is only one of many. The particular vicious cycle that we want to address is um, in this initiative is the poverty trap. And we all know that poverty is one of the most destructive and constraining accessibility barriers. Um, most of us within the community here have been focusing our regulations and much of our advocacy effort in addressing accessibility barriers, but poverty underlines all of these. We also know that disability is not the cause of poverty. It is how society treats disability that causes poverty. And this is a very critical and important thing to remember in our design initiative. So moving on with the design brief, um, some of the criteria we want to meet or the goals are to avoid the unintended consequences of other programs. And quite often um, we call this uh, the COBRA effect or the unintended consequences of treating a problem more simply than it is a complex problem. And this is undeniably a complex problem. And some of those unintended consequences include the disincentives to find work, to form relationships, to leave an abusive relationship um, the loss or clawback of other essential supports that we depend upon and the restrictions on where we can live so that we, the, the actual attempt to address poverty reduces our mobility. We also need to make sure that it's available to everyone that needs it without rules that unjustly exclude anyone. Um, and many of us, I, I've heard and many of us have often said, this doesn't make sense. It isn't fair when we talk about things like ODSP or Asia or many of the other programs that currently exist. And the time and energy to fit into and manage the system should not detract from and exceed the time that it takes to manage your life. The other part of the design brief is that it needs to be responsive to changes in the economy. The level of real support should not be diminished as the cost of living rises or other economic changes happen. And it should not cost our dignity or ask us to barter our privacy for essential support. And so going through that design brief, it's not an easy task. It's actually more difficult than any of us realize because our processes, the processes we use to design, the processes we use to plan, to do many of the things that we, ha we have started to try to do here are a large part of the problem, in fact. They're part of that vicious cycle. How we identify a problem, how we make decisions, how we provide evidence and determine what is true, how we evaluate things, how we plan, how we scale thing, the, the solutions that we create, how we monitor how well we're doing, and even design and even design for good tends to be biased against people with disabilities and tends to add to those vicious cycles. And often I like to dis explain this by talking about a human starburst, which is actually um, an interesting um, phenomenon that many people have noticed who look at problems or to who work within uh, academia. 
basically, and it's, it's a simple concept. If we were to take all of the needs and requirements of everyone here attending this um, webinar or in any population and plot them on what we call a multivariate scatter plot, that means that there is not just an X, Y coordinate or only one way in which we're thinking of the problems, but all of the problems all together because we're all complex and we all are have a multiplicity of ways in which we need to address our problems. What we see is what I, we call the um, human starburst. And it's not the, um, the flattened view um, that we're often um, exposed to whether it's when teachers give us grades or when we view the, the progress in terms of COVID-19 fighting, um, because that denies our differences and reduces us to a single measure, but a starburst. And in that starburst, what you will note is that 80% of the needs and requirements are clustered in the, in the middle, taking up 20% of the space and the remaining 20% are scattered away from the middle, taking up about 80% of the space. And it's those 20% out at the periphery that people like Richard Koch and others have said are the difficult 20%. And those are usually the individuals that have disability. And what you'll note is that the people or the needs in the middle are very, very close together, meaning that their needs and requirements are very similar. But the further you move away from that middle, the further and further apart those needs get. And so that means that the needs at the edge are more different from each other. And because of this pattern and this phenomenon, and because of people like Richard Koch or um, people who do research um, or many of the other practices and processes that we have, those are markets, the way that we um, sell things and advertise things, the way that we communicate things. And most designs, whether it's of policies, products, services, um, or things like interventions in attempting to address poverty work for people who are clustered in the middle is more difficult as you move from the middle and um, don't work as you reach the edge. And from a knowledge perspective, and when we talk about finding truth or um, giving evidence of something, those uh, pronouncements that researchers make that the majority of Canadians, the most women, most men, most children, the average citizen are highly accurate for anyone that's in the middle is inaccurate as you move away from the middle and is not true as or is wrong as you reach that outer edge. And so this pattern permeates our entire life, our society. Um, there and I'm. I have a very complex additional di diagram here, and I'm just going to very quickly step through it. But I can make this available later as well. It shows the disparity, the rising disparity that permeates every part of our system, whether it's that our designs fit people in the middle and don't fit anyone that's out at the periphery. And especially as our uh, lives have gone online now with COVID, the availability, reliability, functionality and cost of online systems works very well for people in the middle and is getting better and better. But for anyone that requires alternative access, it's often decreasing in availability, decreasing in reliability, functionality and cost truth and evidence is largely developed and um, funded for individuals in the middle. And in fact, we determine truth and evidence by virtue of what works or what is true for that middle. And individuals out at the periphery are ignored, not recognized and not understood. Education tries to make everyone like the middle, which makes it hard to fit and ranks everyone according to the middle. Work um, tries to produce replaceable workers. And if you're not the same as everyone in the middle, then you face greater exclusion and barriers. And even democracy, and last week we talked about democracy, depends upon majority rules. And what happens 
to those individuals that are small minorities and outliers. We definitely need to think about how we redesign and how we, we um, advance and not reduce democracy to only majority rules. So what's wrong with our processes in general? We reduce diversity, we ignore complexity, and we deny change, uncertainty, and weak signals. And for anyone that lives out at that outer edge, we know that life, that we are diverse, that our lives are complex, and that things change, that things are uncertain, and that we, um, individuals that are out at that outer edge are most vulnerable to the emerging issues and crises to come and are most aware, therefore, of the weak signals. So what we have in attempting to address problems or in designing is we have a mindset that where we prioritize the impact for the largest homogenous number when people with disabilities are not homogenous. Um, we measure and determine truth for the statistical average when if you have a disability, you're not part of that statistic. In fact, most often you're an outlier. And our response to survival and threats have, as we've seen in the rationing policies that have come about during COVID is to sacrifice who we misidentify as the weak um, to address the survival of society as a whole. And in fact, what we know is that being at that outer edge does not mean that you are weak. In fact, you are more adaptable and resilient. And what we also do is we compete to be the strongest, which um, uh, de degrades and denigrates the system as a whole. And these things are entrenched into our um, mindset how many times, and, and all of us, I mean, all of us are use these systems and this mindset as part of how we think, how we judge, how we live our lives. How many times have we said winning or best, normal or average in our daily life? And we all sort and categorize. And unfortunately, even within this community, we sort and categorize. Um, and this, I mean, Sesame Street teaches us to sort and categorize our, we learn how to do this in kindergarten. But of course, this can cause divisiveness, stereotypes, assumptions about particular groups. And it leaves people stranded at the edges and falling through the cracks. Anyone that doesn't fit our boxes, our, our sorting, our categorizing, the advocacy groups that we create, um, is left stranded at the edges and falling through the cracks. And even our problem solving is a problem because what we assume is that the problems that we need to tackle, those gnarly complex problems, those vicious cycles can be fixed or solved when in fact, we know that there isn't really a fix or a solution. There are approaches to dealing with it. We have to continue to be vigilant to the changing and uncertain terrain. There is no best, perfect, or fully accessible. There's only a continuous process to addressing the changing terrain and the issues that we face. We're not done or complete. And we can't scale something that we have determined is the solution by formulaic replication because we don't fit a formula. So what is the alternative? And this is where inclusive design comes in. Um, at the IDRC and with the community that is part of it, um, we've tried to frame it, and this is a flexible, adaptive, co-designed framework in three dimensions. The first is design for human difference and variability and support the agency of the individuals that um, are uh, those individuals that are different. The second dimension is to create an inclusive process. Here's where the nothing about us without us comes in. 
co-design and continuously ask who is missing. And the third dimension is that we strive for benefit for all. We're intervening in a complex adaptive system. And so we have to be cognizant of the ripple effects of any of our design decisions. So what we do is we design for human difference, not formulaic, not a checklist, not a rigid structure. And we acknowledge that the only person um, that can be a true expert in their requirements and needs is the individual with lived experience of those requirements and needs. And what we need to do is to provide them with agency in determining that progress and also give people time to achieve a sense of security and safety. We need an inclusive process. We need to continue to ask who are we missing Who's not represented? Who isn't part of our advocacy groups? Who's falling through the cracks? And we need to en ensure that those individuals are able to, once they, we found them and once they are there to participate, to also participate in redesigning the process because it's not enough to invite people to a decision-making table that they didn't help to create. And most importantly, what we need to do at each turn is to invite those individuals and um, ask them to help co-design those individuals that have difficulty with or can't use the current system that we've created. One thing to remember is that we are navigating a very, very complex terrain. That means there's very many hills and valleys. And that means that it isn't a linear process, meaning that it isn't sort of a, a set of rules that we can follow one step at a time. It's not something we can engineer. The only formula when we are working in a complex terrain is diversity and collaboration. We need diversification and difference. We need to include diverse perspectives. And one thing to note is that sometimes you have to go down to go up. Failure and mistakes are often the most valuable learning experience. And what we're trying to find is what, we, what is called the global optima that gets us out of that poverty trap. And we can only do, it, do this by stop doing the same thing over and over again and by working together. Because what we're seeking is benefit for all. And um, one of the things that has to happen in order to achieve one benefit for all is to take note of all of the nested systems that our solution works within. Um, an example that I can give is, let's say we're trying to address the learning needs of a child with a disability within a class, you change the way that the lesson is provided. If you don't think about the requirements for the teacher, then there's a friction point and it breaks down. If you don't then think about the principal, the school, the school system. So we have to be cognizant of this and we have to use what's called full social costing um, in providing the evidence. The one thing to note about the human starburst is that innovation and weak signals are on our side because it's out at that outer periphery that we find innovation and the weak signals. And by designing for that outer edge, uh, we make room for change and growth for everyone. What we use is not a, a Gantt chart or a PERT chart or those uh, engineered plans, but a virtuous tornado where we continuously iterate toward the edge and create more resilient designs, more adaptable designs, more innovative designs. And just very briefly before I wrap up, one of the, the challenges that was put to us last week was representation by Peter McLeod. And unfortunately, this is some, one of the things we also need to rethink um, because in the view from the edge, random selection doesn't get to those people that are out from the edge. It does leave people unrepresented um, because of course, uh, unlike those individuals in the middle, 
uh, the, the, we may be only represented by ourselves. There may be no one else that has the particular issues or problems that we face. And we wanna make sure that we don't have tokenism, that we don't uh, have consultation fatigue by asking the same people over and over again to represent. And we don't want people to be called to, represent, to verify foregone decisions. There's one strategy that, that we've been exploring, which is called liquid democracy, where you choose who and when to delegate your dem democratic choice to. And the, one of the most gnarly issues that we need to address is who qualifies and how. And here we need to make sure that we include those edges, the invisible, the episodic, the unrepresented disabilities within our community. And um, this is difficult because we don't like fuzzy indeterminate edges or variability. And we live in an economy and mindset of scarcity, which tends to cause us to reduce and to try to prevent more and more people from using the system. And this often gets to the issue of policing. But one of the things that we've learned in studying other systems around the globe is that if you expect people to be honorable and trustworthy, they will be. And the best policing strategy is with kindness and fulsome support. Security systems that are too rigid challenge bad actors to, to try to crack the system and creates barriers for people that need the service the most. And they end to end, tend to cost more than the service that you provide. And one of the things to remember is that we are defending pre a precarious program. We need to think about what is evidence and what is in impact and redefine that and how to scale and what happens when this disruptive moment passes um, because we have this, this amazing opportunity, this window of opportunity that the COVID situation has presented with us where everyone to some extent is experiencing what it is to be out at that outer edge and all of a sudden things become possible. But one of the things I know in working with government and in working with many of the systems that will make those decisions is that the, some of the emerging power tools such as the surveillance systems, the smart currency, the automated decision systems are actually going to exacerbate the problem. And of course, we'll be asked about cost. And what we have been able to prove is that if you plan with the edge, you will reduce cost. You'll have a less brittle system and it'll have greater longevity. And we have a very, very disruptive opportunity to model a transformation for the rest of, of the world and the rest of society uh, because diversity is our th strength and inclusion is our greatest challenge. And I'd love to continue the conversation about the power of inclusive design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Utah. And, and many of you are asking if the PowerPoint slides and the video will be available. Um, and yes, we will get those out to you soon. And, and I think many of us are looking forward to listening again and, and taking a closer look. But Utah, one thing that I, I've learned from you that, that makes a difference in my life every day is that when we plan for the people at the furthest edge, the people with the most challenges and barriers, and design something that fits for them and it fits for everybody. So I really um, appreciate that and, and look forward to continuing to work together with you on, on this. And one person who really practices that is, is Gary Block. And next, I would like to invite Gary um, to talk about some of the work that you're doing um, in Toronto and, and just expand on what Utah has said. So welcome, Gary. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, and I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak here. Um, so first of all, a bit about myself, uh, just to locate myself. I mean, I am, uh, I consider myself to be a white, male, Jewish, cisgender, heterosexual, high income settler uh, with no uh, proclaimed visible or invisible disabilities. Uh, I work as a family physician 
Uh, and I've been doing work in so the downtown part of Toronto for 16 years now, working largely with people uh, who live at low income, who experience homelessness, uh, the large majority of whom uh, have some degree of disability. Uh, and, I, and I should say that my, my role uh, and the way I choose to work really does ground me in stories. It grounds me in individuals' narratives. It, of course, also uh, grounds me in data and science, and this is what I'm trained to do. And so I'm always kind of walking this balance between individual and collective perspectives. Uh, but given that, I've got to say that I've, I've been increasingly moving towards uh, raising the primacy of individuals' stories in guiding my work. Um, and a lot of this comes from working really on the kind of social margins uh, of society, especially with people who experience homelessness, uh, people who've really been pushed out to the extreme socially. Uh, and that work has, has, has led me to learn to spend a lot more time listening uh, than speaking. Uh, and a lot of, uh, which has allowed me to sort of move beyond kind of expected understandings, uh, uh, and in fact expected anything with the people I see, right? And allowed me to really enter the particular and individual stories of the lives of the people who are sitting in front of me. And I say that because uh, I, I really do relate to the perspective that, that you chose to bring forward, right? The, the idea that we need to look to people's individuality uh, and really to kind of complexity, complexity of individuals and complexity of uh, our society as a real driver for design, especially when we come to something as complex as thinking about a, uh, a, a income support benefit for people who live with disabilities. Um, and really this idea that we need to find solutions that speak to the broad realities of people's lives, but also allow diverse individuals the space to define their own needs. So uh, the, this focus on individuals and their needs really has led me to, into the world of advocacy. Uh, and I spent a long time doing advocacy around building support programs, especially income support programs provincially here in Ontario. Uh, also advocacy within the healthcare system to push health providers to, to take this approach of, of learning to understand the, the lives and perspectives of the people that sit in front of them and learning to ask about people's social situations and their stories. Um, now, very specifically, my work has focused on poverty and income security. Uh, and I was actually asked to sit on something called the Income Security Reform Working Group uh, a few years ago now. This was a provincial group that was set up uh, by what was then a liberal government here in Ontario and tasked with laying out a 10 year plan for income security reform for the province of Ontario, right? So a huge task. And as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, required a lot of negotiation, a lot of consideration, a lot of thinking, and especially around this idea of how do we bring forward a program that will not allow anyone to fall through the cracks. Uh, and I could spend hours talking about the specifics there, but I wanted to hone in on one particular piece of our discussions that I think is very relevant to the work we're doing today. Uh, and this is discussions that we had around what an appropriate definition of disability should look like. Uh, and we actually realized that we were sitting with a very good definition of disability, right? The definition uh, that, that existed for the Ontario Disability Support Program. Uh, and we looked internationally at what different definitions looked like and actually decided that the one sitting in front of us was probably the most inclusive definition that we could find for any major disability support program internationally. Uh, and that's because it was real and is really structured around a functional definition of disability. Right, so one that doesn't require a declaration of, uh, or, or doesn't center on a diagnosis per se, but centers on 
how people function in the world and in different areas, including work, their ability to care for themselves, their ability to take part in, uh, in the, their lives and their community. It also is one that allowed for and continues to allow for intermittent disability. Uh, despite requiring a year long uh, existence of that disability, it does allow for either continuous or recurrent disability. So I bring this forward because when the liberal government here changed uh, almost to a conservative government, almost immediately the conservatives threatened to change that definition of disability to one that was going to be far more restrictive, far less function focused and far less uh, in touch with the individual realities of living with disability. Uh, and we were very afraid of this. And we established a very unique advocacy table, which we call Defend Disability, where we brought together people with lived experience of disability, lived experience of living at low income and in poverty, uh, health providers, policy experts, and advocacy organizations for various health conditions uh, and disability related conditions. Uh, and we carried forward a, a fairly substantial advocacy campaign over the last two years. And we actually just found out the government has agreed not to change that definition of disability. Uh, we are carrying this table forward into other types of advocacy around uh, income security for people with disabilities, both provincially and federally. But the power of that table that mixed different people's stories, different people's expertise is really something I have not experienced before. So all that to say that there, there is a real power in bringing forward expertise and bringing forward stories and lived experience. Uh, I certainly agree with Yuta's approach of grounding that advocacy in people's stories and especially the stories of those who live on the margins. And I do think that that, and from my experience, I've seen that that is how you bring the most inclusive possible approach to design of even something as broad and, and seemingly universal as a disability income support benefit. So I think that's my five minutes. I'll leave it there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Aaron Johannes. I usually work with uh, Liz Atmansky. And uh, because of COVID, she's at home right now working on her iPad. And we're hoping to hear from her in a minute. But uh, our role here is to kind of represent in plain language and, and try to uh, make things more accessible by using graphics and, and smaller words. Um, and But I, I'm feeling a little odd about representing that because, um, yeah, so we'll just give it a good try. But usually when I work with Liz, I find out lots of things that I've been missing. And one of the things that's been really interesting over the last few years has been working professionally with her and uh, then her becoming kind of somebody that people actually request to come to conferences and, and they wanna hear what she's thinking. And at the end of our session, people will come up and tell her how important whatever it was that she drew or said was. Um, and so that's been that's been really, really powerful uh, because we've had probably 500 conversations with different groups of people around leadership and disability and exclusion and inclusion. I really like that Judah's uh, uh, <clears throat> um, holistic, I think is, is the word. So that's not a small word. So Liz will have to fill us in with one, uh, but her, her holistic, uh, take on how, how many different things come together to create the conditions that we um, think are social, that are actually manufactured, they're actually uh, <clears throat> social construction. So the, the small word, I think, is, is represented by, I've drawn this table. My friend Chris used to call this the welcome table. And so it's the table that can encompass as many people as you can bring together. Um, and has ways to have everyone get what they need. Um, when we started talking to people about these ideas, one of the things they needed was to know what they could bring, not how they were gonna be served, but how they could contribute. And so I like, I, I love this idea that Yuda has found for us some ways to think 
about things like the starburst and, and uh, the human starburst in this as a way to address the, these rising disparities. <clears throat> it's been really concerning around COVID to watch some people get left out. And it's also been very powerful to find um, ways for those people to be included. And uh, you know, a group, a group that I'm part of, uh, where we started off wondering how we were going to get our elders online. And now I'm interested that when I talk to the elders, they're discussing which social media platform they like best. <laughs> and two years ago, they were determined they weren't going to have anything to do with it. Uh, one of the things I was just doing a little background reading on Yuda, and then she mentioned it today, is this COBRA effect. And I think that that is so interesting. We end up in these situations at meetings and uh, where we're talking to people representing different parts of government and we're like, how the heck did we ever get here? And I think this COBRA effect story, uh, which comes out of colonized India, uh, is a really good story for us to keep remembering that uh, someone thought of a good solution. <clears throat> it's like our friend Alec Mansky says, someone thought of something good and then they wanted to do something better. So they wanted to include more people in that. Uh, but then it becomes kind of a stamp instead of an individualized solution. So this is a really fascinating and ambitious uh, plan. And, and I love that Yuda has given us some ways to really think about it. Um, and I really liked that at the beginning, Rabbi and Jonathan were taking these different perspectives. It was a very personalized perspective. Here's what's happening for me. Here's what's happening for my brother. And you could hear in her voice, this is a real story. This is one of the stories that we want to hear at the welcome table. And then Jonathan's story here is we're getting bigger. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're a force to be reckoned with. So yeah, is Liz available? Okay. Hi, so this is what I have so far. So it's a world that I drew and a bunch of um, words. One says faith and democracy and I got some more and I still need to write, but that's what I got so far. And I did that to um, make it colored quoted so you can see which is the different speakers. This is really cool. I love doing it this way. <laughs> okay, back to you, Anne. I know one of the things that we did last time and that will happen again is that we'll make these, these graphics, Liz's graphic and this graphic, available to people later on. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erin and Liz. Next, we're going to hear from Luca Patuli. And we have a video to show you of Luca's work and then, and then Luca will hear back from you. So Tom, if you can cue that video, thank you. No matter what age, race, sex, or ability one may have, everyone can dance. Dance is within all of us. Some choose to share it with others and some choose to keep it to themselves. Life is a dance whether we know it or not. We are constantly dancing with every movement we make, with every breath we take, and with every beat our hearts make, a rhythm is being created. movements that make the greatest difference in a performance. Just like in life, it's the little things that matter.
It is up to us to determine how we want to communicate our dance to the world. Dance is the ultimate form of self-expression and it is the escape that always reminds us that everything is going to be okay. Dance challenges us to surpass our limitations by discovering strength within. So live your life to the fullest and dance beautifully. What would I do if I could reach inside of me and to know how it feels to say, I like what I see. What's up, everyone? How's it going? My name is Luca Batuali. I am also known as Lazy Legs. Uh, je viens de Montréal pour tout le monde. Uh, J'ai fait cette partie moitié français, half in French, half in English. Um, just to give everyone a little bit more of my history, um, je suis né avec l'arthropose. C'est une condition de naissance. Uh, ça fait que les articulations et les os du corps. I was born with a uh, musculoskeletal disorder called arthropyposis. Um, that affects the bones and the joints in my body. Uh, for anyone that is visually impaired, I just will quickly describe myself. Uh, I am kind of a short person, but I have a very strong upper body uh, and a very uh, uh, small, smaller or uh, uh, skinnier lower body. And I use crutches to walk. And so in the video that was just being shared, um, you're seeing me doing different positions on the floor using the strength of my arms and my crutches and I kind of uh, fly around uh, throwing my body in, in different uh, positions. Um, just to give you a little bit more background uh, with activities that I do, um, I, I do believe I, I'm a strong promoter and ambassador for dance. Uh, I believe that dance is the one thing, one of the things that really brings uh, all different types of people together. Uh, so I have an international dance group called Ill Abilities. As, as Gary defined the definition of disability, one of my uh, things that I want to do is take that word and, and replace it with ill ability because in hip hop, what's bad is good. So the word ill, which literally means sick in hip hop means amazing and incredible. So when you see something you like, you say, yo, that's ill. And ill abilities is really about amazing and incredible abilities. And I truly believe that every single person in this world has a talent hidden within them. And we just need to take that time to discover what that is. Um, à Montréal, uh, j ai, j ai, je passe beaucoup de temps. Ma, ma femme, elle est une ergothérapeute. Um, puis elle est danseuse professionnelle aussi. Puis moi et Melissa, on, on donne des cours spécialisés pour des jeunes avec uh, des besoins, uh, des, des différences de, ou des ill abilities. Um, puis, Avant, on avait un programme de danse où qu'est-ce qu'on faisait? On certifiait les studios de danse pour les rendre accessibles. Um, we were renovating dance studios to make them accessible. And then we were training dance professionals to understand how to work with uh, uh, people with disabilities. 
And um, what was really important about these dance classes was just the social impact where dancers who don't have disabilities were in the same room with dancers who, who did have disabilities. And what we saw was that everyone was learning from each other. And there were certain movements that the dancers with disabilities that were, they were uh, our students and myself were doing naturally because that's the way our bodies move that other dancers who don't have disabilities got inspired and started using some of those movements and incorporating it through their choreography. And um, that's one of the things that I, I find that it's that through, well, I guess why I'm here and, and something that I want to share just in terms of the idea of, of, of inclusive design is that it, it's important that governments and society un understands that we all learn from each other. And as Gary mentioned the, about stories is that if we all take the time to understand and learn from each other's stories, then we'll have that opportunity to be able to incorporate those stories in just our day-to-day -day society. Um, and I just want to finish off with one last like project or something because Yuta was talking about the school system. And um, while I was building my dance program, I, I currently put a, a little pause on the program because I have, I have an, another baby. I have a seven month old daughter who actually has a disability as well. She has uh, arthrogryposis just like me. And so I'm just right now focusing on, on, on the family style of, of things. But um, I was working on a school project where we were training teachers to use examples of disability within their regular curriculum. So just to give you an example, and, and we were doing it in a fun way to not, to make disability look cool. Um, so for example, a math class where all the students are blindfolded. And this would just be a half an hour experience, but the students would understand what it's like to be visually impaired for a little bit and how they would have to adapt. Or um, uh, uh, an English class where a student would have marshmallows in their mouth and they would have to recite a poem and it would give the other students an understanding what an, a language impairment would be. Mm -hmm. And essentially we were doing all of these activities for uh, everyone to understand how we can just all learn off of each other. Um, and so I think that that's one of the steps that we should start taking is, is understanding how we can use disability and how we can learn from our stories um, for others to experience it and the, inclusive design will also start forming organically within our own communities. So I just wanted to finish off with that. And I just want to say thank you all very much for allowing me to have this experience. Wow, thanks so much, Luca. Um, you told me that you do workshops sometimes in, in teaching people to dance and maybe we need to book something like that and what an amazing talent that you have. And um, also for the, the advocacy work that you're doing, I just really appreciate um, that you came to um, be part of our webinar today and, and share some of your story. So thanks so much, Luca. It's an honor, thank you so much. And I definitely look forward to continuing uh, being a part of this project, and, and, and I really hope that we will be able to get the, the, the disability or the illability, uh, the voice out there, because uh, it's, it's our time. Thanks. That, that's great. Maybe we'll all start learning how to speak hip-hop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Luca. And, and Rabia, and Jonathan, and um, Aaron, and Liz, and Gary, you all talked about the importance of, of stories and about everyone being involved. And as we, we look to help design what this Canadian disability benefit looks like, making sure that it will impact um, as many people as possible. And um, we've now come to the part of our webinar where the presentations um, have now completed. And we want to um, also offer an opportunity for some of you who are interested to participate in, in a breakout session and to share some of your own stories. So in just a minute, like we did last week, um, I'll offer you an opportunity to move into breakout rooms. You'll have about 10 or 15 minutes to talk to the other people in your group and share with them a part of your story. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you had a good conversation in the breakout rooms. I look forward to hearing how it went for you. So please be sure to give us feedback so that we can learn how to do this 
even better and make it as easy as possible for everyone to participate. And, and now we've, we've reached the end of another webinar. And I wanna thank you for everyone who, who shared such personal stories of, of how this benefit could, could impact you and make life um, easier and allow you to, to do the things that you need to do. And, and as we wrap up, I, I want to invite Rabia um, back to to share a few a few closing comments. So so Rabia, over to you. I was saying we we just have a couple of minutes left here, so I will make my remarks really brief today. Again, it's been a fantastic fantastic session. A few words that resonate with me today that I think have been woven throughout, but maybe more explicit than ever before today, are power design, democracy, story. And, you know, there, there, what, there's a TED Talks that was going around by a professor in the UK, and it was talking about, you know, it was related to racism. And she talked about the danger of a single story. There is a danger in a single story. We don't want to perpetuate stereotypes and bias and prejudice if we lump all the stories of people with disabilities together into one narrative, because there are many individual unique particular narratives. Barriers are unique to our individual social locations and ex lived experience. Lived experience is critical and informs our story. But that danger of a single story also carries tremendous power if we can in fact design that single story that can bind us together into a united, unified movement. If we can in fact transform this notion out there of a disability community into a reality, an actual community. And if we can leverage that power of a single story and keep repeating that narrative, that single story of people with disabilities that is all inclusive from all the various margins with all the various unique elements to lived experience, incorporating the ideas of allies and experts, if we bring all of that together, it will be indeed powerful building of movement based on a single story, pa leveraging that power to say, it is time for change. It is time that we learn from history and we learn from our lived reality today in this journey through this pandemic and truly confront the reality of financial barriers that people with disabilities face and the fact that we deserve a reasonable quality of life and the fact that we will not gain wealth by having an income supplement. We have to be democratically involved to shape that supplement, to appreciate the fact that we have barriers that we face, we have a contribution to make to this society and having some financial support that is universal, that is national, that is not clawed back, that is not defined by anyone else, but us has to happen to improve our quality of life so that we can be contributing Canadian citizens with disabilities, just like everyone else without disabilities. Nothing about us without us folks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabia, and, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Say a special thank you to our partners um, and individual organizations across the country for helping to support this webinar. So that wraps up our time today, and we hope to see you all again next Thursday. Take care, everyone.